thank you guys um, for, for joining today's session. Um, this is something that I've been personally like been excited about because it's all about social entrepreneurship and business with a purpose. And um, I'm excited to have um, our speaker, Lesejo Sokolong Altzato. So I hope you guys will learn quite a lot from her. But yeah, before we, we start with the session, I just want to maybe just acknowledge um, one of us, um, our sponsors and partners, which, are, which is um, Amazon Web Services. So while we wait for some few people to jump on the call, I'm going to share my screen so that you guys can um, just know what it is that they have to offer to small businesses. And if you wanna somehow get involved with them, you can just drop us um, an email or a DM um, so that we can share the information. So while we are waiting for people to jump on, I'm just gonna play a one minute video. So yeah. There's a reason why for the last 13 years, startups overwhelmingly prefer to build on top of AWS. We're the largest number of services, making it easy for you to take on some of the biggest challenges with the smallest teams. We also have partnerships for the top VCs, accelerators, and incubators around the world, making it easier to secure your next round of funding. I'm a solution architect with the AWS Xstart program. And what we do is we work with startups in the education sector and we help them build their uh, services on AWS. So we power tech AWS is diversity and inclusion outreach program. The program is really twofold. One is to increase the number of underrepresented technologists within the industry. And the second is to provide a platform for them to be seen and heard. If you're wondering how the AWS evangelism team might be able to help your startup, there are many ways. We're technically credible across our entire catalog of products so we can help you figure out which services might be able to meaningfully impact your business. We also want to help tell your story. So if you're building something cool, we want to know about it and help spread that message to the world. So you might end up on stage at an event like AWS Summit. If you're a startup, you should also definitely check out the AWS Lots. These are event spaces that are free to anyone with an AWS account. You can treat them like co-working spaces, but the awesome thing about them is that we also have people like technical evangelists like myself solutions architects that come and give hands-on technical workshops and sessions to help you learn how to more effectively utilize the AWS products and platforms that you're already building on top of. We are a dedicated team of people that love startups, that we just want to come and help you with whatever we can, whether it be technical or business focused. We are here to help guide you and make sure that you, know, you do have a say in what's going on. We do get your feedback. We do bring that feedback to the services. That is what we're here for. Um, so those are some of the services that um, AWS or Amazon Web, Web Services um, offers. So please do visit their website or even just um, send uh, a, a direct message to one of our social media platforms too, so that we can give you guys more information on that. And then the other sponsor that I would like to acknowledge is PayFast. So um, please also just visit their website and especially if you're planning on launching an online or an e-commerce um, business, please just visit the PayFast website to find out um, what services they can offer to you. Or if you need more information, please just um, send us a DM on Facebook or Instagram or even Twitter so that we can assist you with that. So yeah, um, once again, I just want to acknowledge everybody that is in the room. Uh, thank you for, for taking time out of your day to join us and to listen to our speaker, Lesejo. I'm hoping that you guys are going to learn quite a lot from her because she really is doing amazing things. Um, she's all for entrepreneurship with a purpose. So, yeah, um, before uh, we start with our fireside chat, I would just like to uh, read Lesejo's bio so that everybody has an idea of what it is that she does and who, um, and who she is. And yeah, she's doing really amazing, so I'm very excited today. So Lesejo is the CEO and founder of Bogamoso Impact Investments. She is a 2019 Tutu Fellow, has been listed as one of Mail and Guardian's 200 South Africans. She has been awarded a Standard Bank Top Woman of the Year and received the Trailblazer Presidential Award. She is the co-founder of Raise the Children International, which is a registered NPO. 
Raise the Children International identifies self-motivated orphans from impoverished and rural communities and mobilizes resources for these children to gain access to higher education that leads to employment and public service with a high return and social investment. Her, her heart for sustainable education-based poverty alleviation in rural areas pushed her to take this initiative further. Once she recognized the need for income generating activities to revitalize the mindset and economy of communities from which her orphan scholars hail, she founded Bogamoso Impact Investments. As a social enterprise solely de dedicated to uplifting remote underdeveloped areas of the country through agriculture and entrepreneurship. Bogamoso intru introduces innovative agricultural solutions to poverty, educates as well as incubates local rural entrepreneurs. Bogamoso's mission is to nurture the country's rural smallhold farmers into by tapping into their latent economic resources, which have remained unexploited for decades, such as fertile land, land and most importantly, human resources. She's also running an initiative called the Million Hives, which we will hear a bit more about as the session progresses. Um, so welcome officially, um, Lesejo. Welcome to the Bloemfontein and Startup Brand community. Thank you so much, Fifi, for uh, inviting me. And thank you so much um, to everyone who's taken time to join. And I want us to be, um, yeah, relaxed, like casual. And yeah, I really appreciate your time. We re um, we're really excited to have you here simply because you are, you have a different take on entrepreneurship. So I really hope that um, the people who are in today's session will get some um, valuable lessons. So yeah, um, I think we can um, jump straight into it. So uh, in normal startup grind fashion, before we jump into the nitty gritty of the business side of Listejo, the professional side of mm -hmm. Listejo, we just want to find out quickly um, who is Listejo like, who is she and what are some of the things that make Lisekho who she is today? Yeah, no, thank you. Um, I don't get asked that question often, but then I grew up in uh, in Mafiking. I'm originally from, from Mafiking. My family is from um, Daung. And so I, I grew up around like strong women, like my mom, you know, was, was a hard worker. My, my grandmother was a hard worker equally. She was a teacher as well. So I think, and, and also they were both entrepreneurs in their own right. So my dad also, like I grew up as a, as a daddy's girl. Um, yeah, I, I had such a special relationship. It's just unfortunate that, you know, both of my parents passed away. But then I, I look at the time that I spent with them um, as something that was like very special and I'm really great, grateful for that. And they've taught me valuable lessons that have made me who I am. Um, that have made me to um, see the world the way that I do based on how they saw the world as as well. And um, yeah, they, they were caring people. They were, you know, they, they were people centered. Everything that they did was around improving the lives of people. So, so that's, that, that's me. Um, yeah. Um, so um, I'm glad that you spoke about that because I was going to, say that in the time that I was doing my the research, um, when myself and the team were putting together the questions, um, we spoke to your Instagram a bit, <laughs> and we saw that you met in all the wonderful women that have helped shape the person that you are today. So um, I think what you are saying about your parents um, also existing to, to improve the lives of others ties very well, mm. ties in very well with the whole social entrepreneurship space. I'm operating in right Absolutely. now. So yeah, it, it, it's it's quite nice to find out where it all comes from. So yeah, um, so my next question for you is that obviously you travel the, the world quite a lot. Um, you studied in New York, you did your master's in at the London um, at the London School of Commerce, you lived in Asia for a bit. Can you maybe just tell us about some of the fondest um, memories or experiences that you had um, traveling and living on the other side of the globe? And what are some of the lessons you would say um, you learned 
to leaving the country or okay. living elsewhere. I'm going to try to do this in the shortest possible time because I could write a book about this. But um, <laughs> uh, we, have, we have the time. Yeah, but then um, so 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 after my parents, you know, passed away, the the uh, prior to um, my my dad actually passing away. I went to a boarding school that uh, my grandmother went to as well. Back then it used to be like a missionary um, school called Tiger Kloof. Um, and so it was shut down in the 1960s, like during apartheid. Um, and then it was reopened in 97. So I did my, my boarding school there. So when I was in grade nine, that's when, you know, my mom passed away. And um, the school was very, very kind enough to really offer me like uh, a bursary to like finish. But the school was very unique. Um, the school is called Tiger Kloof. I think I mentioned that it's, it's in Freiburg in the Northwest province. I think what's unique about the school is the relationship that the school has with, um, you know, private schools all over the, the, the country. And, and these are like prep schools. And so when I was in grade nine, I got an opportunity to go um, actually a month or two after my mom passed away, the school, uh, obviously it was like a, a rigorous progress uh, program. But then um, the school, um, you know, um, gave me an opportunity to apply to be an exchange student at a school in Cape Town called St. Cyprian's. And it's one of those like high end schools, you know, coming from Freiburg where I thought like, yo, yeah, life was like good. You go there and you have kids coming from all over Africa. So I think that's when like my whole world started to like broaden, you know, from this young girl who grew up in Mafi Gang to like being exposed to this school and the type of education that those kids at St. Cyprian's were, 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 were getting. Um, and how they thought about their futures. They were not just thinking about themselves being in Africa. They were thinking about themselves being all over the world and taking space all over the world. And so I think I was sort of like the the seed was like already planted in my head back then because I'm like, yo, if if I if I manage to get into that school or, or go on an exchange to 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 that school, and if if I if 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 I saw that those people aren't as much different from from me, and there's more that that that's in me that that I can give. Um, surely I can I can stretch myself, and so so that's one. So two, when I came back from from Cape Town um, in in um, when I was doing my grade ten um, or grade eleven, the school gave me another opportunity to go on an exchange program um, at a private school in New York and to attend a conference in uh, Massachusetts, another private school, like one of the wealthiest schools like in America, where you know Trinity. You, back then, kids were paying like forty thousand US dollars, like. Um, for a day student. So I've I've been really privileged and honestly like blessed. It's been God who's done, who's opened doors um, for me. And I think when you enter into spaces like those closed up, um, you know, spaces like Trinity School um, or, or DFL Academy, you just realize that there's just so much in you as an individual or in me that I had not really like explored and I could stretch myself, right? I could stretch my mind. Um, and so when I was at, at, at Trinity, I was hosted by an African American family um, there um, in, in Harlem. The, they um, had a daughter that went to Trinity as well, and so they had invited me to actually um, come back, um, you know, to to America and and and, fin and do my university studies there. And that's how I ended up actually um, going back to America. Like that African American family, they would have obviously chosen to sponsor any kid in Harlem. Um, but then they believed in me. Um, they wanted me, or, or, or sometimes I think even when in, day, in times when I didn't even believe in myself, they believed in me more that I could actually um, make it into U US universities and I could even do more. And they saw me as playing a bigger role in building South Africa, not just receiving the scholarship and then staying in America. So that's how I ended up um, in, in America for university studies. Um, but then before going to America, uh, while I was still in high school, I started like a, an after school program. And I think for me, that's where the journey began that really um, defines a lot of the work that I'm doing right now, because I, I got exposed through working with the Youth Arm of Rotary Club International. I got exposed to some of the challenges that, you know, our young people were going through, um, going into townships or villages where people had absolutely nothing. For me, even coming from Mafike, it was like the first time seeing poverty like face to face. And in the back of my head, I've always known that, you know, there's something that, 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 that I need to do about it. And especially education, because I saw how education was playing a big role in opening doors, like in my life. And I thought, you know, one of the ways we could actually help people to get out of poverty is, is through education. And so I 
before I moved to the US for university, I actually worked as a grade one teacher at a, at a village outside of Mafiking uh, called Ariahan in primary school. And, you know, as an inexperienced um, young person who just finished matric, teaching grade one with 60 students in a class was stressful, but also it was such a pivotal time for me um, because I got to understand just how complex our education system is. Um, you know, oftentimes, you know, we are removed from the situation. We blame the teachers, we blame the parents, we blame this. But then I think what hurt me the most was the fact that a lot of these young kids that, you know, uh, were part of our program or, or were, were going to my school end up in this vicious cycle where if they don't get support from home or from the school, they end up dropping out. Some of them get pregnant and, and it goes on and on and on and on. And so at that point, obviously, like um, I, I did my year and then I had to go to the US for university. But then I think it really formed a lot of uh, the foundation for the, lo the, the work that, that I'm doing today. And so I, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that was quite a mouthful. And um, I'm glad then that American family did sponsor you because what they saw in you is actually manifesting right now. So we must thank that American family for, <laughs> for the role that they I will play. thank them. <laughs> um, and I also see we have Atiba Mohale from Durban. So we, we're happy to have you in the session as well. This is the nice thing about um, going virtual because you're not limited to like a space. So um, mm -hmm. um, you've, you've said quite a lot um, and I can see, um, I think it's becoming quite clear as to why you went into the social entrepreneurship space. So um, I, can you maybe just uh, briefly just give us a, a full picture of what it is that Bukamoso Investment does as a whole? What are some of the things like your day-to-day -day activities and what services do you offer? Okay. So Bukamoso Impact Investment was birthed uh, in 2015, um, you know, out of a desire to really use business as a catalyst, um, you know, to tackle some of the, the social challenges. And, and, and I think I did not know much about the social entrepreneurship world up until I um, did my master's at the LSC and I got to work with interesting clients, uh, one in particular in India who's, who had developed this low fee private school model and, um, you know, he was his impact was like great because the kids were getting like great results in terms of like the academic. They were getting into um, good universities. Uh, but then also his model was like lean and um, he was profitable as, as well. And, and I think for me, I started thinking about um, how do we actually create um, or, 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 or solve some of the challenges in South Africa, in particular looking at agriculture. How do we bring in more young people in, in agriculture how, how do we come up with um, you know solutions to some of the, the the challenges or red tapes that they're experiencing right now, um, the barriers um, into into the agri? So, Bukamoso Impact Investment is you know it's a social enterprise focused on you know using entrepreneurial uh, methods or approaches to solve some of the the, the country's pressing issues. So, we provide um, policy. Um, you know, advices. We also provide um, consulting to clients that are in the agri space. Um, so some of the clients that we work with, it's uh, the Jobs Fund. So the Jobs Fund was started by the National Treasury to help entrepreneurs or to help businesses that are uh, working on, you know, um, um, uh, increasing jobs in, 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 in the country. So it's been such an honor, honestly, in the last two years to be working alongside like the Jobs Fund, um, Cernic. Cernic is, is, is actually a free state Kronstadt based um, company. Um, they've also launched um, a program where they're helping black emerging cattle farmers. And so we have more than 100 um, you know, black cattle, actually 660 cattle, fa black cattle farmers in, in the free state. And, and so I spend a lot of time in the, in the free state as, as well. So, so, so that's what Bukamoso Impact Investment does. And then we have another arm called Bukamoso Foods. So that's a platform that we use to add value uh, and, and process our, our products. So one, one of the things that we realized even along the entrepreneurial journey is that, you know, uh, growing vegetables or product isn't just good and you could grow grains or whatever, but also you get more money by value add. So these are some of the things that we've sort of like have been learning um, and along the way. So we have Bukamoso Foods, which, which does honey, moringa and other products. So all the, the value add and then Bukamoso Impact Investment that pretty much does like 
consulting and training and, and, and policy advisory? So it seems as if you've been quite a, quite a lot. Me. So can you maybe just, because I, I, I hear the consulting part of the business. So could you maybe touch um, a little bit more on um, the social part of the business and what are some of the success stories that you've had with regards to the, um, the social and um, part of the business? Yeah, no, so on the social um, part of the business, um, and then I think even though it sounds like we're doing a lot, I think they're all like inter interrelated. Um, so one, we've started um, an agri-hub in a village called Manyeledi, and um, we actually um, have a charity called Raise the Children. We provide scholarships to orphans, and that's where some of our orphans are coming from because we just thought, you know, the grant program is not going to work, right, forever in South Africa. So we need to come up with, like, entrepreneurial solutions in these villages. But then you can't just expect people to be, you know, agricultural um, entrepreneurs. They need training. They need access to markets. They need access to inputs and, and all of that. So what we did was to set up a hub. We're going to also put in money to set up a hub in the middle of a village. So this hub is like accessible. So people get like basic um, agri training, horticultural training. They get um, training on how, how to manage beehives. And also we've been able to partner, which I think it's been one of the biggest impact uh instead of us reinventing the wheel we believe in like pulling people in that have uh that have experience in certain areas for example we work with uh with unisa they provide um entrepreneurial content and training to our 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 farmers in the village and most of the time these are people that have either dropped out of school or these are like mothers whose husbands are working in like in the mines um these are young people who have no metric um, or have metric, but then they could not get into any school because of money. And I mean, we, we, we know the story. So it's been interesting. Um, it's been really good to see the impact, to see someone who maybe never thought about taking agriculture formally and, 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 and getting all this training. And we've also partnered with the ARC, the Agricultural Research Council. They provide all the research. Um, we, we, we pilot a um, few stuff with them, which is all like exciting. Um, so bringing everybody like together and also seeing our farmers go from like no background in, in agri to setting up their own tunnels, setting up everything from scratch and selling that for me is like knowledge that, you know, it's, 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 you know, it's impactful and we're not really interested in like certificates. Uh, what we see impact as is more of like someone self-sustaining and, and running a business. You're, you're doing a lot. <laughs> so um, I think the one pro program that I want to ask um, about particularly because you said it is based in the free state, which is the one with the scenic group. Um, how does one become a part of these programs that you're offering? Because I know that a lot of people want to get into, into farming or agriculture, but um, don't have the know-how. So how does one access um, these opportunities that you are um, that you guys are, are giving out, as well as, or oh, particularly the scenic group one, since it's in the free state. Yeah, yeah. Well, the scenic group one is actually very interesting because we are, trust me, struggling to find farmers um, or people to join our program in the free state. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, so that's why that's why we had to go to other provinces because now we're scaling to other provinces because we can't find enough especially young female farmers in in the free state um so what we're doing uh so the program is divided into three so um one uh you need to have access to like land uh whether it's communal land or it's land that you lease from government or it's your own private land and because it's 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 a it's a cattle program you need to at least have some experience as a as a cattle farmer but then even if you don't have land or you don't have cattle you can actually start off in tier one where you learn about the pro like you get incubated you know you go for training in in Kronstadt they have a training center there and then tier two it's actually when you have land and you have a minimum of like you know five cattle it doesn't matter the breed whether it's bonsmara or not like it, it doesn't matter and obviously like you have like access to 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 land um and and water and and all the infrastructure and so when you get into uh level um, tier two you are also put into a co-op where you get 
your your salary subsidized or like a, like you given a stipend uh, of three thousand five hundred, and then your worker, if you have a worker, you, your worker would get like a thousand five hundred rent um, uh, stipend, and there are other benefits as well. When you get into tier three, that's when you you act, we actually give you thirty six bonds maras, um, including like a bull. Uh, you get over 450,000 rand of um, infrastructure development. So to fix your fences, your dams, anything else really that needs to be fixed. And then you also get an opportunity to be part of the value chain. Yeah, Scenic to sell into um, the abattoir um, because Scenic slaughters more than 200,000, um, actually 2,000 uh, 2, car carcasses a day. So it's such a great opportunity for like for, for growth. But then I'd say one engage you know um follow scenic on the on facebook or or, or um on the website um and then once we once they advertise because from time to time they advertise like training programs and stuff so just uh, reach out but i will also give details to um the team so that they could know who to talk to if you're interested in in that but we need you guys like we need you guys to to join okay. That is an amazing program, and I can see um, quite a number of people in the chat um, being quite excited about it. I saw somebody's asking, is it in Durban <laughs> as well? So, um, <laughs> but yeah, um, like you said, you will, we will communicate whatever information that you give to us on our social media platforms. So, um, I like you did, um, I mean, yeah, you did say you, you did your master's in social policy and development. So, like, what was the thought process behind getting into the agricultural space? Like, how did you think, how did you get into that agricultural space? Because somebody would think um, you did social policy and development. Where do the two um, come together? Yeah. I think for me, what I've learned also going to schools such as the LSC is that like you're you're not really, um, you know, like forced to be in like your area of like studies, whereas I've met people that have done like classical stud, uh, you know, study classical music and then they they're working in finance. And I think the opportunity for me being at LSC, even though I was doing social policy and development, they're also like interrelated in that. Um, I took a class in, in, in social entrepreneurship while I was, at, I was at the LSE and I realized that my, my passion and heart was to really like create a business um, that also addressed like so, social issues and, and it doesn't matter like which area. And I, and I think before you get into any business, obviously you need to do like re research. Um, but then for me, agriculture in Africa made more sense. So those are the two things that I'm passionate about, agriculture and education. So agriculture, South Africa, it's a no brainer, has one of the largest arable land in the world. Um, you know, a lot of our, our, our young people uh, are in rural areas, old people, family members are in rural areas. And also we see a lot of migration from, you know, rural areas to cities because there aren't opportunities in rural areas. So my approach when I when I thought about it was, listen, why, why don't we actually come up with solutions where we could focus on, you know, um, make, making agriculture sexy and also helping young people get started um, and, and farming the land. And also we have a lot of communal land, even in the free state, Tabansu area, all around Mutsabelo, there's, there's a lot of like communal land that is not being used. So I also spend time going to like countries like Israel. Israel is like the size of like Kruger National Park and half of it is like desert, like there's no water in Israel, there's nothing. But then they're like the net exporters, you know, of like fruits and vegetables, anything you can imagine. And they've used technology to, to do that. So I think when I saw that, I was like, surely Africa can do more. Surely South Africa can do. We can actually create businesses. And and, and it's not just like pri primary farming. There's like logistics. There's like, um, you know, uh, tech. There's so much, you know, that you can do. Because I think sometimes people only focus only on, um, you know, you being in the field, yeah. but then they don't look at the entire value chain. And so, and, and I started doing a lot of research um, and I started looking at how much South Africa imports. We import like so much, like billions. We import chickens, we import cucumbers, the very same cucumbers that someone can actually grow yeah. in, in the free state. 
and for that that person will actually have an income so it looks like you know and and i think for me when when i look at south africa we've been growing our our social spending has been growing more and more government social spending on social grants and stuff and that's not how it's supposed to be we are capable people are are capable but we just have to deal with the the, the red tapes or the barriers that prevent people from like growing and like you mentioned earlier it's access to information people don't know how to get the information they don't know how to be part of a program and so that's how i ended up in agriculture <laughs> and i realized at the bottom of it i realized that there's so much money because even with COVID, you saw all the industries can shut down but then people will never stop eating you need food yeah no i'm happy that we are having this conversation because I, during COVID, as an entrepreneur myself i sat there i was thinking to myself you know we can't operate we can't do anything what industries are still functioning and food was at the top of the food chain. <laughs> it was there, and we were eating more during lockdown. So <laughs> um, I think it's, I'm telling it's an you. interesting space to be in. And I think you guys have succeeded in making um, agriculture sexy again, because it seems as if now everybody's trying to get into it. But that whole access to information thing is, is a big um, is a big wall that we still need to jump over, because people want to get involved. but they don't know how to start. So I think what you guys um, are doing is is very, like, is amazing. So um, just to remind everybody, please do um, have put your questions in the chat box so that we can ask some of the things that you guys would like to know at the end of the session. So you've, um, so you've spoken a lot about um, Africa and entrepreneurship and, you know, um, and social entrepreneurship. How would you define social entrepreneurship um, for yourself and what do you what what would you say is its role within the, the the african continent and why is it so important in our african context i think one is um helping young people like realize the potential that lie in each of us you know um, and, and I think the challenge for us is that we've sort of like, um, like the way that we think sometimes is that, you know, we want to be employed, but then, and, and not all of us can, can be entrepreneurs, right? And, and, and so I, 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 one, think that we can actually change, um, come up with, a, with, with, the, the, with the solutions that impact our lives, even impact our, our continent. So one, I, I was looking at how we actually take um, some of the raw products like cocoa um, to to um, uh, and, and export it, you know, um, globally, and later on then sell it back to Africa as chocolate. Yeah. So I, I think that the biggest thing as a social entrepreneur is that like one, you can, the idea of like making money, it's good. You should never think differently or negatively about making money because you do need money obviously to make change. It's not the only thing that you need, but then in order for you to like scale your impact, you, you need to grow. So one, think about your your business or your entity as something that needs to be making money as much as you know you are you are you are you are, you are impacting um, change as well. And then two, think about your community, the community um, that that you want to impact. Also, think about how you want to involve them. But then you shouldn't run it as a, as an NGO, right? You're either like running this as an NGO and and dependent on like donations and and stuff, which it's fine, but then uh, the way that I think about social entrepreneurship is you can act, the beauty of it is achieving the social impact as, and, and at, at the same time achieving the profitability of your business. So as a social entrepreneur, the first thing is focus on making sure that your business um, is, is, is on the right track for growth. And I mean financial growth. Okay. Um, so what, cause what would you say some of, are some of the challenges that social entrepreneurs are facing that other business or other types of businesses or entre entrepreneurs are not facing because you know we it, we are so um sort of like in between those are ngos or npos mm -hmm. and then the other are, are businesses are for profit businesses but with social entrepreneurship you sort of like stuck in the middle do i make um am i making money or am i um having a social impact so what would you say have been some of the challenges that you have faced as a social entrepreneur 
um, in terms of people maybe understanding what it is that you do that other normal businesses don't encounter. So, yeah. Sure. Yeah. So I think it's a, it's, it's a lot because I think the concept um, is just starting to get popular in South Africa. But then like, you know, when I got started, it was a concept that was very confusing to, um, you know, locally to, to South Africans um, and especially with businesses because they either relate to you um, as 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 an NGO and immediately they put you to the CSI section, mm. right? Um, but then the minute you start saying, but actually I'm making money and it's like, wait, we're not going to fund you, you know, if, if you're making yeah. money. <laughs> So, um, so, so, so I'd say that's a challenge, whereas like with a pure profit model, you know, it's like you're there to make money, how you make it, it doesn't matter. You're just there like ethically, whereas as a social entrepreneurs, there are all these things that make us unique, right? It's the community engagement. Um, it's the, the ethics, like it's the fairness, you know, if you're sourcing a product, you want to make sure that the guys who are producing the product are, are, are paid fair wages or, 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 or fairly for the product that they're buying from you. So for me, it's, 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 it's having a hard time like accessing um, capital to get started. And then uh, two, it's also, I think uh, the challenge was having partners that would understand like the concept also given that it was still pretty new uh, back, back then. Um, and also, I think the community element, to be honest, was hard because sometimes when you're coming in into a community, like a rural area, like where, where we piloted our model, people um, have this concept. And I think maybe based on the experience as well of just um, receiving uh, handouts. Yeah. Right. So if you're coming in as an organization or as a company, it's like what what what, what is it that you're giving to them for free? but also the concept of pushing them to think about uh, profitability and making sure that they work for whatever product or service that, that, that you give them, it's hard. And so sometimes, you know, and, and, I, and I think it's maybe part entitlement um, mentality, I think based on some of the programs or services that government, um, you know, gives to our people, it sort of like changes the way that they engage with, uh, you know, people like us as social entrepreneurs. So I think what I've learned from that is that, you know, um, you know, it's it, one is to invest in like key leaders uh, in communities and making sure that they can also go, ahead, you know, if in, in your absence, they can also um, continue to feed the communities like information um, so that expectations are, are managed well. And because we are, you know, we are farming in a communal land, it's hard because it's not land that is owned by Bokamo. Mm -hmm. So it's not land that's that's owned by our farmers. It's, 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 it's tribal land. So sometimes if they see that you're doing really well or the farmers are doing really well, someone can just go to the tribal house and complain that they want, you know, um, land as well uh, because that person also has land. Like there's, there's a lot of that. Yeah. So, so <laughs> yeah. And, and, and besides that, it's also challenges that we've experienced with municipality, you know, and it also gets political. You get thrown into these things that, you have no experience in, right? Because they see you as someone who's providing NGO services, but you're making money. Why are you making money? But I'm like, you're supposed to be making money. So, <laughs> yeah. So those are some of our challenges. Um, I think, yeah, no, I'll, I'll, we'll probably need to take a few tips from, actually, let me ask it as a question um, now. Um, with all the, you know, the challenges that you've mentioned, especially with the political politics coming into play, and then you have somebody in the community saying, no, why, don't, why do they have land? I also have land. Um, what are some of the strategies you would say you have used to, to overcome the whole political, um, yeah, the whole political um, aspect of, 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 of it? Because I feel like that is a challenge that a lot of us do face. Um, you start trying to you do, um, you do things and you're doing quite well. And then somebody from the sidelines sees that, no, this is doing too good. And then they want to politicize the whole situation. What, um, what advice would you give um, in terms of overcoming that? Sure. So one, I, I would say in every area uh, of your business where, where you launch, 
Um, and if you're going to involve the community, always try to identify champions from that community. And those champions are the people that will actually like run with things. Because in our experience in Manya Lady, we, we told the community that, guys, we want to see you guys running it. This is not a, a, a book, almost a project. This is like your you should you should ownership um, you should you should own it there should be ownership in terms of you should see it as as yours and so in every community you always find these people that emerge as like leaders along the way and i think working alongside those people um has i guess helped us a little bit in sort of like f trying to fight those political dynamics um as well and and i think whether you like it or not you're obviously going to get thrown in you, and you're going to have to work with the politicians right or, or you're going to have to make your way around so I, I think also one um engaging um a political figure whether it's in the province on on the work that that you're doing um because ultimately it's going to make them look yeah. good right and and <laughs> and and i think they also sometimes like the fact that you are approaching them and maybe when you're approaching them, you are just telling them, oh, this is what, what I'm doing. I'm doing this thing. And I'm, this is like, you're just telling them um, so that, you know, you would have those people in case people come up with like false stories about you, about the work that you're doing. You will have someone who will sort of like speak on your behalf and, and, and be involved uh, in conversations, whether it's around policies, because I think sometimes we want to be like in in the front in the in the fringes in the in the periphery uh, when it comes to policy, um, our opinions on development. But I think it's so critical for us as young people to get involved in in in, in conversations that really impact uh, the development of our of our people. So whether it's, it's it's conversation or whatever talks that you're a part of, so so that they know that you're you're championing uh, championing something positive. And with our experience, sometimes I think people become intimidated. Because they think that you are starting a political party, now you're gonna make them look bad, <laughs> or you are, you are <laughs> like if I'm if 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 I'm in a, if I'm at an ANC area and then we you know we launch this and then the councillor feels like oh my goodness if I don't jump on this like people are gonna look bad like I'm gonna look bad on people right so I, I think just engaging people and making them feel even though they've not contributed, right? <laughs> Making them feel like they're part of yeah. like the, 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 the proud of like the, the broader vision, because unfortunately those people sometimes can do anything, yeah. right. Um, to, 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 to get, to get you out. So try to be at peace and uh, with people as much as you can and, and try to be involved in like uh, conversations around development so that they know wh where you stand. And I had to make it clear to people, like I'm not part of, any other political party, I'm just there to change people's lives. And it's like a shock. Like, really? <laughs> okay, no, um, I think uh, what you just shared is very helpful. And to myself, um, specifically because we are starting to work on a new piece of land. Um, so I was trying to figure out when we go about this, because as soon as we start working on it, then questions and messages are gonna start floating so um i think what you just shared now with getting people involved and letting the relevant people know in advance um is a, is a good strategy that i am gonna use as of next week either <laughs> um so um, you are doing i'm um, doing another um wonderful initiative and the way that it has grown um called and um, the initiative is called the million hives um the last i checked it was a thousand so um, for it to have changed to a million hives, that means that the numbers are going all the way up. So can you maybe just touch on that mm -hmm. and how, what it is about, how do people become involved in it and what would be the benefits for them? Yeah, so I don't think a lot of people, um, it'll be interesting to find out even from uh, the guys that are listening um, to this now, like how much they know about bees. Um, but then, you know, as much as we're trying to push um, food production in 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 Africa, um, we South, South Africa unfortunately has a huge decline um, in its bee population, and you cannot grow food without bees. Believe me, or, or more, most of your vegetables or, or other foods without bees. So um, one, we we want to also create awareness around the imports that we uh, see in South Africa. South Africa imports seventy percent of its honey from China. 
And uh, Cata Blanche did a series, um, I think it was like last year, where they exposed some of the um, um, supermarkets, well, well-known supermarkets that we go to that sell um, cheap um, diluted honey. So when you actually go to a store and you see that honey is like 39 rand, 49 rand, something that's 500 gram, <laughs> run away, it's fake. Um, yeah. <laughs> And, and, and so we're, we're trying to create awareness around like healthy honey um, and also promoting um, local production of, of honey. Hence, we start we, we came up with an initiative called One Million Hives. Be, um, so Bukam also manufactures beehives. Um, we just moved our manufacturer into Daung in the Northwest province. And our goal is to make sure that by 2025, uh, we can contribute to food production and, um, and reduction of, of poverty in, in, in South Africa by giving an opportunity to young people to own a hive. So buy a hive for a thousand rent. And then with that, Bukamusa buys every drop of honey that um, you know, a, a person um, produces. So that will give you like annuity income, you know, for the next five to, to six years of, of the lifespan of, of the hive. So obviously in year one, you get your returns, um, you know, from, from the, the money that you would have made from the honey that, that we buy from, from you as a, as, as, as a farmer, because you'll obviously be a bee farmer then. But also with our honey, that's very, very special is that we tell the story. So on our, on our bottles, on our labels, we actually tell the story of like where our honey comes from and the impact around it. And so that's the story of social entrepreneurship because consumers now are becoming more interested in, um, you know, where the traceability, where, where, where the food comes from and also the impact. So imagine if you're buying a bottle of honey and you know that, you, you know, that bottle is actually creating like impact and, and an, an opportunity for uh, income generation for someone else. That's your part um, that you play to make South Africa, you know, um, better and, and and grow. So our our website, people can order honey from 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 our from our website. It's called um, Be Loved. We just launched our e-commerce store. I don't know yeah. if people can see. Yeah, it's called B with a with the, with the B and then Loved. And then uh, we have, um, you know, different varieties of like honey. Um, as you can see, we have like the, you have sunflower honey. Um, you know, we have my, um, acacia honey. So you'll see if, if you go on our website and also on our, on our Facebook and Twitter, you can follow us. It's called um, Be Loved. Uh, that's the name of our, our brand. And the handle will be like Be and then Loved. Um, but also with our name we want to share the love as well that people will you know with the sweetness of honey people will feel loved and also to think that you know you get honey you, you get something so sweet from like an insect um it's 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 incredible Not so just any insect yeah. have you ever been tricked but i yeah, anyway, <laughs> let me not go off topic. <laughs> um, I think the one thing that was particularly interesting or great um, about the Million Hives um, project is that um, when I was talking to you, you mentioned that um, a person can buy the hive and then keep it for themselves and they do their own farming or jet honey. Yeah, and they do their own farming or in the case that you don't have maybe the space or whatever, you don't want the admin of being the one that um, manages the honey yourself, they can buy it from you and then you manage it. And at the same time, um, you know that you will generate a, um, some form of an income for it because Pokam also buys the honey itself. So I think um, that is something that is very uh, um, interesting and quite cool. And I know I did speak to you about uh, about getting one as a gift for somebody. Yeah. So I think there's a lady in here also yeah. that did mention that they wanted to get into the honey thing. So yeah, I'll share the contact details on the website on our website and our social media platforms as well. So um, we almost nearing um, the end of the session. Uh, so one thing I would want to ask you is, yeah, um, one thing I would want to ask you is, you know, with a lot of businesses during COVID, they, there were a lot of challenges. Most businesses closed down, but with your business, it seemed as if the opposite ha happened where you flourished during COVID. So what would you say um, were the systems or the strategy that you put in place to, even when everything is going downhill, you, you guys thrived um, during this time? Yeah, so... <laughs> 
that 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 is kind for you to say that, um, Fifi. But I, I would say I think uh, our um, growth came by surprise, um, given you know the the state of disaster our country is still um, is in, because uh, one of the other products that we do uh, we provide you know we package uh, beverages, um, hot and cold beverages. Um, to industrial clients, and we saw, you know, with all the companies shutting down, um, it was like the end of it for for us. But then one other product, you know, that that did really well, it's the honey business, um, because I think, like I said, as more and more consumers are learning about the pro- the food that they put in their body, they started realizing that, you know, one of the ways to keep themselves healthy during um, Corona was to actually uh, boost their immune system by buying real honey. And so we saw a lot of people literally from like referrals um, buying, you know, ordering honey, like in in large, like crazy amounts. You know, it's like similar to like the toilet paper thing in the beginning of COVID, people were buying toilet paper. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so for us, people were trying to stay as healthy like as possible, which mm-hmm. is very good. And also people were really interested in like supporting local, right? So um, like like I, I think it's been such a blessing. And for us, like um, Fifi and I are um, part of uh, the Balo Walden Bayo program. And it's been such a blessing to sort of like focus on uh, now, you know, even during the COVID times to think about how we can reinvent um, ourselves as a, as a business and, and actually make our honey business like grow, uh, grow the production side because we manufacture the, the, the beehives, but also grow like the bottling and making sure that we are, we have, we have systems in place like employment contracts. So some of the things that we had, I guess, neglected, like in the past, making sure that we have accounting system, like it's so important as an entrepreneur to make sure that you have like systems in place. Um, and also prioritize areas of growth because you can't do everything. Um, so find an area in your business where you feel like if you put in an, a little bit of a, you know extra effort, your your it will take your business to like the next level. So for us, it's been creating like e-commerce right platform. Whereas before, people would just like send me a WhatsApp to order. Literally, like I was like tr- um, doing transactions <laughs> on like WhatsApp. Um, <laughs> And it took a lot of my time, which is all good, right? But it took a lot of my, my time. So actually tra- transferring all of that to like an e-commerce system where people can like order. And then, and I had to find people who knows how to yeah. do the work. That's another big thing, guys. Like it's worth the investment. You know, if you get a guy who knows a guy who can maybe build a table, <laughs> it's a problem. But then... <laughs> <laughs> but it's so important that you get experience, guys. So we got Kohi, like he's like our, our tech guy. He built this like e-commerce platform. He embedded um, delivery. You know, we spoke to different delivery companies and we went with the one that was best, efficient. So before you, you go big with your product, one of the things that I've learned, one is to make sure that, you know, we've secured our honey volumes. We work with farmers. You know, we have a database with our farmers and volumes and all of that because we didn't want to be in a situation where we market ourselves so big when people order and we run out of product, um, you know, we put us in a bad situation. It's like reputation yeah. damage, right? So before we launched, we had to make sure that we have everything ready, delivery, uh, e-commerce, um, yeah, and make sure that our, our, our systems are, are, are in okay. place. So, yeah. um, uh, you, um, you did mention, you know, with the Balo Wolf, um, the whole thing of talking about reinvention and how they've contributed uh, to the growth of the business because now you are able to prioritize and see those opportunities. So I also I actually wanted to add earlier on on um, when you were talking about the challenges and the funding bodies not being able to understand what it is that you do and not understanding your model. So yeah, I think with the Mbeu, Balo World and Mbeu program, it's been quite refreshing to get um, a corporate organization that uh, understands the whole um, social entrepreneurship space and is um, authentic and and really just willing to help from a um, a human level. So um yeah, uh, it also brought us together. So <laughs> that's another plus. <laughs> yeah. So um I think uh, one more question for you. Uh, it's actually a two part question. So what would you like to say to somebody maybe that is you know. We have so many issues as a country, as a continent. Um, so what would you say to somebody that is feeling sort of like hopeless or at a loss with everything that is going on? Um, do you have, and maybe 
wants to pursue entrepreneurship, but then all these things are happening. Um, do you have anything maybe you would like to say to somebody that is in that situation? Yeah, um, you know, one, I, I'm like an ordinary girl from Mafi King, right? I, I didn't have any privileges that came with me. Um, my parents didn't have big bank accounts, but I had a big dream, right? And I surrounded myself with like mentored uh, mentors that really believed in me. And even in times where I didn't even see my own potential. And it's so important, um, I cannot stress this enough, to really find people that are positive, that will um, also like reprimand you uh, if they see you going off. Um, it's, it's very important uh, to um, start where you are, start small and don't be afraid to like fail, right? We live in a world or uh, we live in, in, a, in a country where there's yeah. black Twitter, where people will take you to like the cleaners if you fail. And I think sometimes failure, sadly, is like celebrated, you know, particularly with us black people, um, you know, and, and, um, and, and it's sad, but I, I want you to really stay strong. Even those that have lost their businesses or experienced, um, you know, tough times um, during COVID and, and you, are, you are hurting, a lot of people are hurting and you're not the only one. Um, so find that ecosystem um, or community where you can feel safe to talk about uh, your challenges. Also making sure that you take time to 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 rest. But start small, guys. Um, Rome was not built in a day. Um, like Fifi said earlier, like my background is like in social in in in, um, in social policy and development. Zero entrepreneurship background, but I had the heart, right? And I went for it, whether I, I had I was I was experienced in business or not. But also along the way, it's also good to pull in um, people and put in systems that will enable you to like grow. And then two, it's like humility, being very receptive to like feedback um, as, as, as well. Um, I mean, if you look at Alibaba, the guy was like rejected by KFC to fry chicken. <laughs> like he's like the number one, the wealthiest guy, but he kept persisting. And that's what's going to, you know, um, grow you. That's what's going to push you to where you want to go. Like, keep, keep trying. You can fail. Keep trying. Look at the guy who started K KFC. He didn't start until he was like 56. So I'm 32 and, you know, I'm, I'm growing my business. I'm still struggling. There, there are times where my um, people I, I graduated with from, you know, the London School of Economics that are working for like big banks all over the world. There are moments where I'm like, sure, I, I could have received, you know, I could have, um applied for a job in london i could be working in wall street right now i could be making like tons of us dollars but i always think about the dream why am i doing what i'm doing and i'm doing this because i'm passionate about it like it's it's in me like i it, it excites me and no matter how long it takes i i i i i know that i'm doing it not just for me but for for, for my country so so that's the i guess the encouragement that i want to leave you with that you should start small also the biggest thing is Look at your, look at your your social media as a free billboard mm -hmm. to advertise whatever. You could be selling scopas, <laughs> you could be selling scopo. It's your billboard. So if you're gonna focus on posting social stuff, like it's for you, it's fine. But then take advantage and and use free advertising from your social media platform. Okay, thank you so much, Lisa. I I feel like you know usually with these closing statements. People are always so philosophical. Some, um, yeah, people are trying to be philosophical or, create, or paint a pretty picture. Um, and I think for me, it's very relatable and it's, it's very truthful and authentic. So um, thank you so much for sharing that. And it seems as if people in the chat are also excited and we really received everything that you said. So um, for me, this was just this was, has been more than just a conversation. Like it's been such a learning experience, yeah. and <laughs> and I I think a lot of people um, learned a lot as well. So um, I'm gonna move to the chat, and then um, I was I I was hoping that people would be able to ask the questions themselves, but uh, it looks like I have to read the the questions. So um, there was a question from Ratiba asking um so as a social entrepreneur how do you build the system to make sure that the business actually generates an income sorry how do i like do what are I'm, I'm just paraphrasing now 
but it was something along the lines of how do you like what what systems do you put in in place to make sure that the the business generates an income so how do yeah like you know what yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, so one is that you know I don't think our, our you know uh, full profit businesses are different from from us. Um, one, you need to make sure that your sales go. You need to have a sales target, right? That this month you've, we've sold a hundred bottles, but our target this next month is to sell a thousand or, or double it. So having uh, a financial model with like projections, it also helps you but it also helps your team um, be more accountable as well if you're working with with uh, people, if you are part of a team. Um, and I think also too is sharing your vision. I think it's one of the things that we learned at, at Palo, sharing your vision with your, your team members so that you don't get all excited, you have this amazing vision, but then other people are like left behind, you know, like you, you're, you're, yeah. you're not engaging. So I think it's making sure that even in your in your in your growth journey, you motivate people they feel like they are a part of like a, a bigger picture they're not just working for you to 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 pretty much increase sales but then also there should be like accountability in terms of like performance as well so performance matrix and um sales strategy um there's a question also from zinke um she says where can we go about renting land so basically like you said that the land that Pokamos is working on does not necessarily belong to Bokamos. So how do you go about accessing land in that way? So if you're, if you're in a communal, communal area, it's engaging like the local chiefs, mm -hmm. the tribal council, um, but also you can go check in with your um, Department of Agriculture or Department of Land and, and, and Rural um, Affairs because they all usually Oh yeah, in the free state, didn't they give um, land as, as as collateral for ESCOM? There were, I think there was like 140 farms that were just sitting there. So I think you should actually go mm -hmm. and inquire at your local department because I think a lot of people didn't realize that the state has all that land, uh, all, 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 all those farms. And even if you get a no, keep going, like ask for a manager, <laughs> ask for the manager's manager. Keep, keep it's going. funny you say that because I was in a particular, in a similar situation last week. And I'm like, no, come next week and then next week I'd come and then come tomorrow and then tomorrow I'd show up until I went to the manager, manager and eventually something came from <laughs> So irritate, exactly. you irritate people that it works. Um, so there's a, it works. But it does, yeah. So um, Sipe is asking, um, how do you, are you maybe planning on having a course on beekeeping or like your future plans? Yes, it's in the, it's in the pipeline. So if you follow us on, on Twitter, you'll be one of our, uh, many, I guess 10, uh, uh, whatever, because our Twitter handle is like still new yeah. and, and social media. So we will then advertise um, everything uh, there. Uh, but that's one of the things that we want to do as well, like the, the formal beekeeping training. Also on our website, we're going to have um, links to um, on with videos on uh, for people that maybe take bee, beekeeping as like a hobby on, on, on how to harvest, how to be safe when you when you do that. Um, and the gear that you should wear, and even the D DIY ways you can actually um, do your your beekeeping gear instead of buying the suit and stuff. So, be on the lookout on our website. Follow us, um, and then yeah, you'll have okay. all that information. Um, I see there's a question from Sean. It's, he's also asking, how do you buy a beehive? Um, Sean, uh, you can one buy it from our website, but I don't know if because uh, uh, our guy was actually going to put a tab today or whatever the, the the beehive section. But also maybe give us until um, Saturday, and then you'd be able to buy it um, from the website directly, and it'll it'll be shipped okay. to you. Um, and then the last question is from Zin Che. She asks, um, "Do you pay in order to join the scenic group?" project yeah the sonic no it's all free <laughs> yeah so i i i anticipate that you'll be getting quite a, a lot of traffic from 
from from the free state and bloom yeah. so yeah um you know this has been um Please. i was excited to have this conversation but i feel like it became more than a conversation you shared some really um you shared some diamonds you know like the thing with the eskom and the land i don't think any of us yeah knew anything about that even with the scenic group nobody knew that the opportunities are there so um i'm i'm very i'm glad and very happy that you to join us and i think i speak for everybody from the startup grind team from everybody that's attending that um you 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 are an amazing person uh like i i'm i'm, I'm left speechless um, with the type of person you are you are very authentic you're very open so um yeah i i think i am I'm having separation anxiety because <laughs> we are at the end of the session. So <laughs> um, once again, thank you so much. And then whatever questions you had today, um, I'll share links on the Startup Grind, um, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and the website as well. So if maybe you are struggling to locate Bokamoso's um, um, website, then we will also share the links on our platform. So. Yeah, I think you will be getting quite a lot of engagement from the free state. So I'm, 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 I'm happy that you joined us. Okay. Um, no, thank you so much. Yeah, no, I don't know if you have any cl closing words, but the gratitude is in the comment. No, I, I don't. But I, I say I love, anything else in I closing love, um, before we let you go. Thank you so much for hosting me. Yeah, and, and I've really enjoyed um, engaging with you as well. Um, guys, Fifi is one of the people, one of the women that really inspire, inspires me with her journey and just the person that, that she is, her authenticity. So I think it makes it so much easier when you meet entrepreneurs that are like bare, right? They're, they're just like, this is who I am. What you see is, is what you get. And I think that's so important um, in our journeys as entrepreneurs to, to be our, ourselves. Um, so thank you so much, Fifi. You inspire me and thank you for, for everyone's hey, time. I don't, um, I'm not sure if okay i think the even the network is trying to kick us off. um yeah i think we can finally let you go and then you can share whatever um um links and information with me so that i can share it on our platform so thank you um we we can let you go finally um and once again okay. thank you Bye, to guys. everybody that attended the session um yeah please continue to support I think we'll be going back to the face-to-face -face events um, within the next two months or so. So if everything, um, if we still don't have lockdown and we're still on level one, then we will definitely go back to those sessions. So um, yeah, please continue to support us. And from to Ratiba from Durban, we saw you and thank you for joining us all the way from Durban. Um, we saw your engagement. So continue to support our next event which will most, which is gonna be on uh, on sales. So it's gonna be a mini sales workshop on um, setting up sales strategies. So yeah, I, I think you guys wouldn't want to miss that. So bye. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lisejo. No, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, no, this was, this was awesome. I'm, I'm glad it was more of a conversation than anything else. I see people don't want to leave the chat even. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but thank so, you. I appreciate you guys.